Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is from Luke chapter 1, beginning with the fifth verse. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. And the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent to God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth and her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning, beloved. You are indeed God's beloved. You are the apple of his eye, and in you he takes great delight. I hope you never, ever forget that. I want to start this morning by taking a a minute of personal privilege to thank you for the warm and gracious welcome that I've received here at Myers Park. I count it an honor and a privilege to be able to serve here in ministry with you. You know, anytime any of us ever starts a, a new job or a new career or even maybe a new semester at school, we're usually aware at some level of the expectations that cling to us, expectations of success and happiness. Before the first service, Jim Carter pulled me into the aisle and said, so I hear you're preaching this morning. We have great expectations of you. (laughs) Thanks, Jim, no pressure. (laughs) But you know, those expectations kind of hang around like like the aroma of, of lilac and vanilla that surrounded your grandma when she came from the kitchen. And you could expect wonderful things like hugs and pies and love. And there are expectations that hang in the air too here, aren't there? We have expectations of excellence in worship, 
excellence in music, excellence in mission, excellence in education. The bar has been set high. But you need to know that I grew up with few expectations. As one of four girls, three of us born in the early 1950s in a small town in Oklahoma, those expectations weren't really very much. Get married, have kids. So it was a bit unusual when my sisters and I all went to college, the first women on either side of the family to do so. And then it's incredible that the four of us each earned master's degrees, so you could say that in that respect we exceeded expectations. And yet I never lived up to that initial vision, get married and have kids. It was a long time before my mom and my grandma and my aunts quit saying things like, so are you dating anybody now? How many children would you like to have? There I was with three, eventually four college degrees, owning my own home, gainfully employed, financially stable, and it still wasn't enough. An air of failed expectations clung to me like lint on my best clothes. So I feel a special connection this morning with Elizabeth because we're continuing our summer series on people of the Bible who are not always in the spotlight, but ordinary people of faith who are trying to do the best they can with what they've got. Elizabeth is certainly one of those. Sure, we know that she's the mother of John the baptizer. We know that she's a cousin of Mary. We know that she provide, provided mentorship and advice to Mary. Yet in this short section of the Gospel of Luke, the only place she's mentioned, when we first meet her, she's living in the shadow of failed expectations. Even her name seems to highlight her shortcoming, Elisheva abundance, and she's anything but. She's childless in a day and age that would have seen her predicament as being her own fault. No son, no heir, no legacy for her husband. Why has she failed so miserably at the one thing she was expected to do? What is wrong with her, people would have asked. Or even the more sensitive question that Dr. Howell would have us ask, what's happened to you, still has no acceptable answer. It's not much different today, is it? When people fail, when their best efforts go south, when their expectations go unmet, our response is often one of blame and finger pointing. We ask, what's wrong with you? We label, we criticize, sometimes we even ridicule. And the sad thing is, we often heap that same blame and scorn on ourselves, especially when we feel we have somehow failed. I wonder how hard it was for Elizabeth to live for so many years under the burden of unmet expectations. The opening lines you heard this morning tell us that she and her husband were both righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. How did she do that? Where did she find the intestinal fortitude to keep at it? The obvious answer, given the series that we're doing this summer, the obvious and expected answer is, well, of course, she did it by faith. But I mean, how does that work? How does faith help you hold your head high when the world sees you as a failure? More to the point, how does faith get you through the day when you see yourself at fault? Maybe the problem is with our understanding of faith. Some folks think it's a set of beliefs. They'll ask me, well, what's your faith? I say, oh, I'm a Methodist. <laughs> Others use the term in sort of a, a vague, spiritual way to encompass some kind of, I don't know, spiritual but not religious. But it's more than that, isn't it? Webster's Dictionary says faith is an unquestioning belief that does not, provide, does not require proof or evidence. 
There's another definition that shows up in the movie, The Miracle on 34th Street, when Chris Kringle says, faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. And actually, that comes pretty close to the definition that we find in the letter to the Hebrews. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. But what about that phrase, things hoped for? Does that mean that we can hope for anything, that we can take our wildest dreams, and that if we just can gin up enough faith, our dreams will come true? I can see how that approach might have appealed to Elizabeth in the beginning, but here we are some 30 years later, and she's lived a righteous, upstanding life all along, and how's that worked out? Yet year after barren year, she continued to keep God's commands, striving each day to do the right things for the right reasons. And that's because her faith was not just about what she believed or what she felt. Because the truth be told, what we believe and what we feel often harbor doubts, especially when we're awake in the middle of the night, wondering why, in spite of our best efforts, life is not turning out the way we expected it to, wondering whether it's even worth it to keep trying. I'm sure Elizabeth endured her share of dark nights, but I also believe that she knew that the worst things are never the last things, because God has the last word. God keeps his promises, and so she chose to live by faith, not by sight, sure of her hope in God, certain of what she could not yet see. I wonder what it might look like if we here at Myers Park, both individually and collectively, what if we would live like that? What would it look like if we committed to doing all the stuff that Jesus told us to do? Love our neighbors, all of them. Welcome the strangers, all of them. Have compassion. Share life with sinners. Especially now when the world sees the church as irrelevant and misguided, consumed with infighting and obsessed with the specks that are in other people's eyes. Because it seems that the, stick, the sick are staying sick, the hungry are still hungry, the oppressed are still seeking for justice. I wonder what it would look like if, in spite of the church's apparent failure to live up to expectations, what would it look like if this congregation renewed its efforts to live and love and welcome and share and do it because we believe that God has the last word and we believe that God will keep his promises. You know, N.T. Wright tells a story from his time as the Bishop of Durham in England. The Durham Cathedral, built somewhere around 1093, was and still is in need of constant repair. You know, stonework gets crumbly after about 900 years. And so there were always stonemasons beneath his window, hammering and chipping away, shaping stones to the exact specifications of the master stonemason. Wright says it often looked like tedious work, boring, unrewarding, maybe even pointless at times. You know, chucking away at big rocks to form weird shapes. And it wasn't until the stonemason took him out into the courtyard and pointed to a newer looking stone way high on the wall that Wright understood. Because by itself that stone was nothing odd-looking, even looked like a misfit, and all the time it took to shape it that way seemed like a waste, until he realized that the integrity of that whole wall depended on that one stone, faithfully carved over days and hours of tedious work, the only stone that would fit that spot and serve that need. Friends, faith is about how we choose to live day in and day out, especially in the face of difficulties and disappointments. 
It's choosing to move ahead, doing the right things, not just the easy things, even when it seems like a waste. It's holding on to the assurance that God will do exactly what he promised to do. And then we live like we believe that. Because faithful living is what shapes the stones of our lives, including the stumbling stones of unmet expectations. My dear friend Evelyn Laycock would tell us, faith is the continuous investment of trust in the promises of God as lived reality. It's the continuous investment of trust in the promises of God as lived reality. Investment implies there's some expectation of returns. To trust is to rest in, to live into. And the promises of God are not just some vague, cloudy thing in the by and by. God's promises are here now in the present. And that's how Elizabeth chose to live. Just as the stonemaker, stoneworker invested his efforts in the project at hand, trusting that the master stonemason would make it all work, she chose to live investing her life in the reality of God's promise to his people. We sang about that earlier, and we're getting ready to do it again. I don't know if you realize it, but that hymn, Blessed Be the God of Israel, is a paraphrase of what we call the canticle of Zechariah. They're the first words that he spoke following the birth of his son, John. The prophets spoke of mercy, of freedom and release. God shall fulfill the promise to bring his people peace. That's what Elizabeth clung to. And the Bible tells us that six months later, Elizabeth, full of new life, filled with the Holy Spirit, greeted Mary and sang her own song. Blessed is the one who believed what the Lord has said. Blessed is the one. Was that Mary? Was it maybe Elizabeth herself? Could it be you and I? Blessed are the ones who believe what the Lord has said and live like it. For nothing is impossible with God. Thanks be to God.